Sean, what do you think is the most important thing to take away from this data? Pajula and Blue Farm are trash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Playing With Power podcast, the podcast where we talk about all things CEDH, EDH, and Magic the Gathering. I am your host, Ryan, and today we're going to be talking about tournament data, but you're not going to hear from me. You're going to hear it from the proverbial horse's mouth. We have a special guest who's been working on a very interesting project over the last year, and his name is Dr. Sean Spielman. Sean, introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us a little bit about this project. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Sean Spielman. Um, please don't call me doctor if you ever meet me in real life. So Sean is perfectly fine. So <laughs> I am a doctor of medicine. Mr. Spielman, sorry. Mr. Spielman. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you, Ryan, you call me doctor. Everybody else is fine. <laughs> I, so. can, I can do yeah. that. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I'm I'm a doctor of family medicine and sports medicine at uh, Wright State University in uh, Dayton, Ohio area. Um, I have been playing Magic since either Urza's Legacy or Urza's Destiny, I don't know, a long time ago. My memory doesn't go back that far. So, um, But I've been playing CEDH since about the end of 2019, early 2020, around the time Theros Beyond Death uh, came up. And I've been a patron of this particular podcast for oh, over three years now. Wow. Oh, wow. Time flies. Yeah, it does. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. And we're going to dive into this topic. But first, we're going to talk about our sponsors. So our merchandise is now available in our store. We have dice, coins, playmats, tokens, sleeves, and more all available. Go to playwithpowermtg.com and help support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon. Patreon gets access to our Discord, Webcam League, Play Days, early access to videos, names in the credits of our show, exclusive videos, merchandise, and the ability to even be on an episode. There are tiers for everyone, so go to patreon.com slash playingwithpowermtg and help support the show. Also, if you're looking to sponsor the podcast, please reach out in the email below. And speaking of Patreons, we always do a Patreon shout out at the beginning of every episode, and today's Patreon shout out goes to... Mr. Sean Spielman. <laughs> I talked about this, Ryan. It's Dr. I'm Gio, sorry. So. It's Dr. Sean Spielman. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Mr. Mr. Spielman, that guy's a clown. Okay, anyway. yeah, doctor. It's Sean. Sean's been a patron of ours for three years, and we absolutely love him. He's an integral part of our community. So thank you very much, Sean. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ryan. Yep. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into the main topic, which is this tournament project that you've been working on. So let's just dive into the meat of it. What is this project that you're working on? Yeah, so um, ever since Eminence Events started, oh, when is it probably last summer, summer of 2022, if you're listening to this at some point in the future, um, they have, uh, they've since they've started in the time we're recording here, they've put on eight different events. Now, five of those have been the Mox Master Series put on with a, uh, a particular um, YouTube channel called Playing With Power. I don't know if you've heard of them, Ryan. Um, very small, very small yeah, channel. Yeah, small very fringe so but anyway um yep eminence events and uh, uh, has put on up to has put on um three events on their own and five mox master series so they put on eight tournaments total so what i have done is uh, looked at all of their tournament data in other words all of their entrants and we we have uh, i've correlated all that data and what we're going to do today is talk about some of the aggregate data so what we'll be looking at mostly is what does the what does the cdh tournament meta look like based on these data what decks are performing well in in the meta and also to an extent what decks we think should be performing well but maybe aren't performing quite so well we're gonna have some spicy takes on that when we get to that section for sure so um i have to give a big big shout out both to playing with power for putting on the mox master series and eminence events for supporting that and also for making these data available publicly. I cannot do this if their data were not available all on their website. So everything I've done today is publicly available. Anyone could do this, but as far as I know, I'm the first person to manually correlate all this data and put it together. Yeah, that was actually one of the things that we talked about with Eminence when we first partnered with them uh, back when we did the first Mox Masters. I said, the data is king. We don't want to do this if we cannot make this data available to the world. Because up until this point, we've had... Um, guesses, you know, hypotheses, things like that, that allowed us to get an idea of what maybe the best deck is or the best cards are or the best this or that or the other. But it's a lot of been very speculative because we have so many scattered metas throughout the world. Your meta is not the same as my meta is the same as a discord meta somewhere else. And up until that point, that's really all we had. So we had best guesses It's the best way I could really mm -hmm. put this. But when, when we started this tournament series, we really made an emphasis to say, I want the decks to be available. 
I want the, the data to be available. I want it to all be public. And I want people to be able to get this data to do something with it. And that's really been a huge part of the initiative of Mox Masters. And Eminence as a whole has also been rallying behind that idea. They have an API that's available. You just have to request a key. You can go to their website. And they also are very data-driven people. And so it's been super great to see this type of thing that you're doing, Sean, come to fruition and start to see things out of it. Because I think data is king. And we will can get into that in a little bit more detail in a little bit, but I think having data driven, you know, a- answers, better data driven questions, just something that's data backed, is so much better than what we've had so far. And bef- before we go further into the topic, I don't want to get any bad ideas from anybody to think that anything that I said that isn't been data backed so far is bad. I think the tools that we've received and had for the last number of years have been fantastic. We wouldn't have CDH if it wouldn't be for some of the tools that are out there. But I think it's time that we're starting to get into uh, a maturity to where we want to start see data backed things and data backed, you know, questions and answers and things like that. Okay. And just to piggyback onto that real quick, yeah, I agree 100% with every every word you said about that. Um, it's really important to emphasize that data can always tell us what but it can never tell us why. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, and I will bring, I'll try to point that out a couple of times while we're talking about the data um, today. Um, and so it's really important to keep that in mind just because something is showing up at the frequency it's showing up or winning at the frequency it's showing up doesn't necessarily mean that it's, um, that uh, one deck, one deck might be showing up at one frequency for one reason, another deck may be showing up at another frequency. And again, when we get to, when we talk about specific, decks and data points we'll get we'll elaborate on that more i'll give my opinions on that and uh, ryan i'm sure you'll have some thoughts as well when we get to i it. will have so. some very strong <laughs> thoughts on that <laughs> yes, yes. okay yeah. so you told us where the data is coming from was there a reason you started this project was there a reason you started to do this outside of maybe anything that we might have talked about so far was there is there kind of a core driving you thing that made you want to do this yeah i I also am a big proponent of having data. You know, I practice medicine and we have to interpret data a lot and use data to make best decisions for patients and things like that. And so I, I'm, I like to call myself an amateur statistician because I did not major in math or work in a math field or anything like that. But I do work with data in the real world. And so I'm familiar with how to interpret it and what it can and cannot tell us at, in times like that. And frankly, I am, like I said, I'm an amateur math nerd. I like doing this kind of stuff. So um, this looks like a big project. In reality, it probably only took me about 30 hours spread over the last five to six months, something like that. So not a huge amount of time, but definitely something that took some effort and, and thought. So um, not to not to brag on myself a little bit, but, you know, so, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So. Very cool. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, spoken like a true doctor. Oh, it only took me like 30 hours because that means nothing to you, doctor. Yeah. I don't have a wife or a daughter or anything that I'd rather <laughs> yeah, be spending exactly. time with. So <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the nitty gritty of it. Let's mm-hmm. take uh, take us through a rundown of this data. Um, for those of you who uh, aren't listening to it, I'm sorry, who aren't watching on YouTube and they're just listening to it, we're going to do our best to try and tell you what the data is that we're seeing. But on the whole, we're only really, you know, I suggest that you maybe watch this on YouTube or something like that, because we will have data actually on the screen as we're talking about this today. Yeah, so basically big big, very wide, wide view of what's going on here. Like I alluded to before, this is eight tournaments worth of data. And what I've done is I've taken the commanders or the, or the partner pair that helmed each deck and basically grouped them together into a spreadsheet. Um, and the spreadsheet lists both the, um, amount of times these um, decks were played in the Swiss rounds, the amount of time they made top 16 if they did, the amount of times they made top four, which is the final round, and then the amount of times these decks may have won the tournaments as well. And then from those numbers, we can start um, extrapolating some interesting findings and patterns. So just to give you a quick numbers rundown, Ryan, so we have eight tournaments, 128 decks making top 16. Um 32 total decks making top four and eight total tournament winners. So one of the numbers I'm going to be talking about repeatedly tonight is something I've been calling the conversion rate. And what that is, is the number of times a particular commander or partner combo has been played in the Swiss rounds um, compared to the number of times it has made top 16. So in other words, the number of times that that um, 
deck has done well enough to make it to the elimination rounds of of these uh, tournaments. So numbers real quick again. So we have eight tournaments. It's actually 1,002 total decks um, that we've correlated. That's a lot of decks. That's a lot. It's it is it is a lot. So yes. All right. Before we go any further, um, let's go ahead and share your screen. Is that okay if you shared your screen? Yeah. Let me. Uh, forget. So, so what we have on the screen in front of you here is our um, is our combined results from our tournaments and really kind of our top performing decks here. Now, what's interesting about when when we combine the data um, and just look at the Swiss numbers, what we actually see is that. For decks that showed up at least twice per tournament, which is um, we get over eight tournaments, that means they've been played 16 times or more. Um, that actually makes up just over half the field by itself. And, and um, on the left here, you see I have I have 15 decks that are highlighted in green. Those are the actually the 15 decks that show up most frequently in the data. The next 15 decks are all decks that have shown up at least, uh, on an average anyway, at least once per tournament. So decks that you might run into relatively commonly. And when you combine both of those colors on that side of the screen there, you actually get, that's two thirds of the entire field right there, just those 30 commanders and partner pairs by themselves. Um, so um, what's when you go on and look at how they've done in terms of converting over to the top 16, um, the decks that show up at least twice per tournament on average make up 60% of the decks that convert to top 16. And uh, the decks that have been played less than once per tournament, so seven or fewer times combined, still make up a little over a quarter of the field. So the point I'm trying to make here is that just because these are the most commonly played decks and these are established decks and things like that, there's still plenty of room for, I don't know if you want to call them fringe decks or at least le- less frequently played decks to still do well. And actually those less frequently played decks have actually won half of these tournaments as well. So there's, so there's still plenty, like I said, the meta is still fairly wide open where, where you want it to be. But if you want to look at what the tournament meta looks like, here are the decks that are going to, that have shown up most frequently in this data set. That's it's really interesting because this is real raw data. A thousand decks mm-hmm. have been at these tournaments, which is yeah. a lot. <clears throat> it's it a lot of that's a lot of data. That's a lot of decks to extrapolate from. Yep. And what we see here is basically you can kind of get an idea of what you're going to face in two thirds of your opponents from these basically these thirty entries alone, mm-hmm. and you can really pull a lot of different pieces from this. So you can say, well, I'm going to see, we see up here at the top is Tim Nakrom. We see Najila. We see Roger Silas. We see, you know, Tim Nathrasios. We're seeing, you know, uh, we, we can extrapolate kind of what game plans all these decks have. So you can start to, if you're looking for to build, if you're looking to build a meta buster deck, or if you're looking to maybe pack a certain piece of interaction going into your next tournament, you can really look at this data and say, I know I'm going to be battling these decks two thirds of the time. And this allows you to make better informed decisions about certain slots inside of your decks when you're brewing. Yep. One other thing of note here, um, if you can see it on the screen here, is every deck in green, so the top 15 most played decks, if you look at them across these eight tournaments, every single one of them has at least one top 16 performance as well. Um, Mm. That starts becoming less and less frequent as you go down. So what that suggests, at least in part, is that making top 16, when you aggregate tournament data, really can, at least in part, maybe just be a numbers game. These decks are played most frequently, and so they are going to make it into the elimination rounds more frequently. Hey, if you don't show up, you can't make top 16, right? So the decks that show up more frequently make top 16. If you think about it, that does make sense on a, mm-hmm. on a particular level. So um, real quick, just the overall conversion rate for the field. In other words, basically, I'm just taking 128 top 16 performances divided by 1,002. That's 12 points, uh, a little over 12 and a half. I think it's like 12.7%. So roughly one in eight decks that enter the tournaments make top 16. And so because of that, that's kind of your expected rate for a deck. Every eight times it shows up, if it's performing at an average level, every eight times it shows up, it should make top 16 at least once. And that's going to be an important base rate to keep in mind as we talk about over and under performers in a little bit. Very interesting. And <clears throat> when you say that, you know, you know, just the higher quantity just creates, you know, just increases the the odds that something's going to be in there. 
I I definitely agree with that. You scatter shot. You you throw enough of something at the wall. Eventually, something is going to stick. Exactly. Um, and I would definitely see that. You know, obviously, in number one here, we see Temnacrom, and yep. there were ninety one instances. Yeah, that's, that's almost. Good. I, if that's I'm not nine, mistaken, that's nine percent of the tournament field. So. Literally nine yeah. percent of the tournament mm-hmm. field. That's a lot. Nine yep. percent of everyone who entered to these tournaments so far brought this partner pairing. Yeah, and so exactly. you're almost going to be guaranteed to see it as you go through your rounds of Swiss. Exactly. And this is not the last time I'm going to pick on this particular pan- commander combo tonight, but as it's colloquially known as Blue Farm, is uh, quote unquote, by from many people, the quote unquote best deck in the format. We're going to see in the data that that may not necessarily be the case. And we will talk about that in a little bit and why that might be in a little bit as well. Very interesting. I really want to talk about that now, but we're not going to. Anyway, so run us a little bit more through the data. Talk us talk us through a couple more data points or some dig into a little bit more of the pieces of what you have assembled here. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So looking at the uh, looking at the overall tournament meta here. So you see um Blue Farm has been played nearly twice as much as the next most popular deck, which is Najila. Again, a very popular deck, no surprise there. Um, and as we start running down, the numbers do start dropping off a little bit once we get into this yellow area. So um, you see Crick and Shorakai are the um, first decks in kind of this yellow section over here as well. And again, these are decks that have that have shown up on an average between one and two times per tournament on average. Now it's interesting. I, mean, I mentioned the convert the about twelve and a half percent conversion rate a little bit ago. It's actually mathematically impossible for any deck who's made top sixteen and showed up less than eight times to be less than that. And so as we get down to these smaller numbers and down here, my confidence in calling any um, particular calling decks, you know, performances as good or bad gets a lot less confident the fewer numbers we go down because data the the problem with data analysis is you need a lot of data to make data analysis and we just don't have enough data down here to really um to really say uh to really say much about it down here ryan i'm going to pick on goto which is on line 42 on the spreadsheet here because it's your your all-time favorite cdh deck it is Um, if we look at it just as a quick example um it only has five appearances in this in this um in this data set but it has one top 16 performance, one top four performance, and it's actually won one tournament, which I believe was Mox Masters February. Uh, it right? was January, correct. Mm-hmm. It was January. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. It was January. So, yep. Um, so, but five appearances is not enough is not enough for me to really make any definitive conclusions about this. Now, obviously, Ryan, you're going to put your hands over your head and say it's the best deck in the format in podcasts. So, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, uh, but that's where we're at. So, so again, as we get, smaller and smaller numbers here it's it's really hard for me to draw really kind of any definitive conclusions about anything down in this area so as we talk about performances and underperformances we're really going to be focusing on those decks that were listed in the uh in the kind of the top 30 most played commanders because there is where there is where we actually have enough data to actually start seeing if not definite conclusions and at least some trends in the data that i think are interesting and worth and worth discussing so that brings me to a question for you. At mm-hmm. what point would you consider the data to be enough data? And also, by and large of that question, what data is not enough data to draw any conclusions out of? You said, well, hard. We, we, don't have, we, don't, we don't have that many tournaments. I mean, we already have a thousand decks. And you say, well, at a certain point, it's just not enough data. Tell me where you think those lines might be. I knew you were going to ask me that question. I don't actually have a, a good answer prepared for you here. Oh. They're actually waiting. Oh. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, fire this guy. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, there there are people who are actual statisticians, you know, PhDs in math, could actually map that out for us and really kind of determine that. Um, I will tell you, just looking at medical data, you know, oftentimes I'm dealing with patients where we have, if not thousands and tens of thousands of patients in the study data to pick up really, really small differences. So kind of my cop-out answer is the, the, the more detailed we want to get with the data, the more data we need. Um, I, like I said, I can't give you any hard and fast numbers because I'm not good enough to math that out without, without getting someone who actually does this for a living to sure. Uh, no one, no one's going to gonna that, so. hold your feet to the fire. No one's going to be like, well, actually, okay, well maybe comments are going to actually us, but, and uh, we encourage those by the way, because I do want to know what those numbers look like, but what does your gut tell you? What is a number that your gut tells you might be enough to say there's, there's something here. Yeah. My gut would say, 
I think we can start getting pretty comfortable calling it calling the data legitimate for a deck when it gets to be uh, somewhere between probably 150 and 200 appearances, something like that, something like that. OK, so, so we're looking at at least double, you know, for least, yeah, even the yeah. top commander, you know, yeah, exactly. And this is this is roughly eight to nine months of tournament data. So we're going to need probably at least another year of tournament data yeah. before I can really start saying anything about the definitive about the top decks here so again take everything we say tonight with a grain of salt because of that the data the data is fluid and it may change so yep and i also think that that's just part of meta changes too and Mm -hmm. what is uh, there's a thing out there that basically says that once you've been exposed to something it changes Mm -hmm. uh you know this by this by itself could tell people to do something which could influence outcomes Mm -hmm. you know knowing that Tim Necrom does X, Y, and Z might tell people to latch on or to let go of Tim Necrom. This is just an arbitrary example, of course, Mm -hmm. but like sometimes when you have certain pieces or data sets that allow you to extrapolate information and make educated guesses on, this can really change the outcomes of things. Mm -hmm. If you told me that Goto was the best deck in the format, I would believe you. But mm-hmm. you unfortunately have data here that says it absolutely is definitively the best deck in the format because it already <laughs> has a win. So it's clear that, no, I'm just kidding. But like <laughs> you said, hey, there's only five entries. One of them won. That, that, that sounds a little bit more like an outlier or a fluke. Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound like actual data-driven results here. Mm-hmm. Uh, that person may just be really, really good. Um, you know, shout out to, you know, shout out to Mox Masters January winner. They were really good. They did a really good job. But you know, only five appearance, uh, five appearances. So that's st- you know that statistic, that ratio of that particular commander is really skewed high. But mm-hmm. if you're not looking at the data from a holistic overview or a full data set, then you might not actually have all the information available to you. So let's dig in. We've we we have an idea of what's going on here. Let's talk about what everybody wants to know. What are the overperformers? What are the underperformers? What is the data kind of telling us about the commanders that and the and the decks that are out there? What is the data saying? Yeah, absolutely. So Ryan, if you'll click on the near the narrative tab there on the, the it should be the last one on the right. Yep. Boop. Yeah. So <laughs> so what we're gonna do next um, is actually look at as Ryan said, some of the decks that the data suggests, not definitely says, but suggests might be underperforming or overperforming a little bit. Before we get into that, there's a couple of decks where we don't have a lot of data points that I want to, that I want to highlight because I think they're interesting and these are things to keep an eye on. So the first one I want to talk about is Dargo. Um, Ryan, you and I have both seen Dargo Thrasios win two Mox Masters events. And we just saw a Dargo Ikra deck. Um, finish in the actually make the finals at Punt City too. Um, mm-hmm. God, that deflecting swat was so painful, wasn't it? So yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> it was brutal. So, um, but anyway, um, it's interesting because Dargo Thrasios as an archetype only has seven appearances, so that's not enough appearances for me to, to say anything definitive about it. But of those seven appearances, it has made three top sixteens, and it's actually won two tournaments. Now those are incredible numbers. So. That's a, that's a top 16 conversion rate of just under 43%, which is way higher than just about anything else we're going to be talking about today. Um, but it's only seven appearances. So what do, we, what, do, what do we say? Is it really truly the best deck in the format? Is it being piloted by people that really know it really well? Does it fit into a kind of a blind spot in the meta where maybe there's not a lot of hate for this type of deck? You know, it's, it's again... The data can tell us the what, but it can't tell us the why. Yep. Uh, yep. Similarly, Dargo, Ikra, four appearances, two top, two top, two, yeah, t- two top 16s and one finals appearance as well. So again, only four appearances, not really enough for us to draw anything definitive, but it's trending in a direction that makes me think that these two, these two um, archetypes are really underexplored right now. Um, I think everyone has probably drawn those conclusions themselves based on the re- based on the fact that Dargo has won two tournaments um, this year already, or I'm sorry, December, and then once again this year. Um, but yeah, it seems to me that these two decks are, in particular, are very underexplored. And uh, I know I personally am going to be exploring with Dargo Thrasios a bit here in the coming months, and we will see how it goes. So... Um, kind of in a similar vein, we see that a Thrasios, Thrasios Jessica only has four appearances, also has two top 16. So that's another Thrasios and Red Commander um, pair 
that may be underexplored as well. Again, could be a, could be a fluke in the data, or it really could be that it's a strong deck that people just aren't really. It's just not on people's radar right now. So, um, and then one other one I want to highlight too is Tim Natana as a pair. You know, traditionally this has been Blood Pod. Uh, lately, um, it has really kind of moved off of the Blood Moon effects and is now uh, now the archetype I think is called Bloodless Pod. Yeah. Um, colloquially, yep. yep. It has eight appearances in the data and three and three top sixteens. But I want to note I think at least two of those top sixteens are by the same player. So it could be in particular this <laughs> particular player might just be really good with this particular archetype. Um, Yep. I think there's something to be said about that too, before we go any farther, is that you're pointing out that you're actually making that as a specific call out in some of these data points where you're saying, hey, Dargo Thrasios, two tournament wins by different players. Tim Natana, at least two of those top 16s by the same player. Because like you said, this doesn't give us all the answers here. It's not telling us the why of something is happening. It's telling us what is happening. And we have to start asking better questions based upon this data of exactly what's going on. And this is a really good question to ask, in my opinion. (laughs) Is it the deck? Is it the pilot? Is it a combination or is it something else? But having this data and seeing this data will say, well, we have two tournament wins by different players. It wasn't just someone who's been grinding this deck for two plus years and has just only been on this deck and is the best pilot in the world of this deck. It's actually by two separate people. And so it's that that starts to ask the question, Okay, maybe it's not just that a fluke maybe of, of a really, really, really good pilot in the hands of a very, of somebody who's had a lot of experience with the deck. There's something to be said here. And the same thing with Tim Natana, three top 16s, you know, pod decks aren't dead. Apparently three top 16s. And that's really saying something. And you said, well, at least two by, were by the same player. And so there might be a little bit to suggest that it might be, like I said, that just skilled pilot. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. All right, let's get into the spicy parts here. Oh, this so, is going to make so many people's heads spin. This is what yeah. I wanted to talk about. This is yep. the, what I want to. I wanted to start with this. I wanted yeah. to lead this, with this part. This is this is where all of our YouTube engagement is going to be, Ryan. Is in these <laughs> these sections right here. So yes, okay, right. so let's talk about the decks that the data suggests may be underperforming. Again, I know I keep harping on this point. Don't definitively say that they're underperforming, but suggest that they might be underperforming. So these are decks that have at least 12 appearances in the data out of the out of the, you know, just over a thousand decks and have a less than 10% conversion rate. So they are converting less than one in 10 times when they're playing. Let's start off with the two decks in the data set that don't have any top 16s in their name. That would be Crick and that would be Shorakai. These are decks that I know have been featured on the channel a lot um, in gameplay videos, and I have seen Crick decks win on turn one and turn two repeatedly in these videos, Ryan, but there are no top 16 performances when the data suggests there should be at least one, if not two, if this were performing at it, even an average level. What do you make of that? I think that there is a lot that can be extrapolated from that. For the longest time, we said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Shorakai. Sure. For the longest time, we said that Azorius never had any good commanders and Azorius was a weak color because it didn't have something to back it up in the command zone. And then Shorakai came out and everyone said, oh, it's an it's a humility deck. It's an ISO rev deck. There's something here. And I think everyone clung on to the fact that this was the first somewhat viable, you know, Azorius commander that they really, really wanted it to work. And people have been brewing it and people have been trying with it. But at the end of the day, while we may have had a more a stronger uh, option in the command zone for Azorius, I still don't think it's enough to actually hold up uh, against the current meta. It's stronger. I mean, you know, people tried Lavinia Azorius Renegade at one point, but everyone eventually discovered that it's better in the 99 than in, com- in the command zone. But I think that's part of the reason that Shorakai is probably where it is yep good mm-hmm. and then and then crick um i personally don't have much experience playing against it i don't know if you have but again we've all seen the youtube videos where yep. it wins on turn one or turn two so what do you make of what do you make of crick i think crick is really good when crick had it, what's the best way that i could put Kirik is that it is the top of its the top of its b tier 
is the best way I can put it. You know, whenever you're talking about tiers, S, A, B, C, D, F, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, you kind of put these rankings on things, but you know that within those particular tiers or letter grades that you might assign something that there's a little bit of fluctuation. One might be a little stronger than the other just because of certain things like colors. And I think Carrick is the top of the B tier. Mm -hmm. However, when you go into the tournament, unless you're playing against all B tier level stuff, you're probably going to get outmatched by all the A and S tier things. But Kirk does really, really well against other fellow B tier commanders. But when you're starting to get into the Grixis pairings and things like that, it's finding itself probably floundering a little bit too much to really be able to close the game in a quick fashion. We have lots of very fast decks out there. Kirk is not the only kid on the block that can go fast in this format and others have things like counterspell and stack interaction backup to back up their super quick wins whereas Kirk doesn't really have that so like i said i think it might just be at the top of the b tier and sometimes when you're playing in other b tier metas it might have a disproportionate look to it that might make it look like it's actually more of an a tier when in fact it's just really at the top of its b tier that's mm. my conjecture anyway Sure. Yeah. If uh, assuming these data were hold out over the long run, I, I think that's a good point. From a statistical standpoint, this could just be not a, a too small of a sample size, and that these these just um, have just had some bad luck and things like that as well. So exactly, yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not calling these bad decks at all. There's not enough data to determine that at all. Um, so, uh, but at the moment, they are at least trending towards underperforming. So. Um, Moving on to kind of the next the next culprits, these are all relatively similar. We have Inala, 12 appearances with only one top 16 in this data set. Malcolm Vile, my personal pick for my deck at uh, Mox Masters March and Punt City, 21 appearances, two of those are me. And only one top 16, none of those are me, Big Sag. So, and then, <laughs> um, and then Yuriko, which is surprising, a deck I see a lot. 22 appearances, only one top 16 among them now we're starting to get into the you know once we get into the 20s we're starting to get into numbers where i'm starting to be maybe very slightly a little bit more thinking that these might be trending towards real phenomenon here a little bit so um ryan what do you think is going on here so there's a lot that i can extrapolate but let's let's focus more into like the 20 plus appearance thing sure um because once again this is data that's giving us the ability to ask questions and that's what we're doing right now we're just trying to ask better questions and that's what i actually love about this whole project it allows us to ask better questions i would be very surprised that you told me that yuriko was an underperformer quite frankly um i would consider yuriko an a tier deck before this data came out, I would have put it in the A tier. Mm -hmm. I might not have put it in the S tier, but I would have put it in the A tier. Mm -hmm. It's in good colors. It has the ability to do things like cheat commander tax. It has um, mana. It, it has card advantage in the command zone. It has ways to close out the game very efficiently with like Oracle mm -hmm. Consult. Um, and it has so many different things and it had so many different axes, axes, axes yep. that it can pivot on. And yeah. so and, it and sound if I can if I get at one thing, it actually yeah. got a lot of help from Kamigawa Neon, Di Neon Dynasty yeah. last year as well. So it Yeah. And so yeah. it's it's gotten a boost in the last 12 months too. Mm -hmm. So for you to for the data to say, hey, this is actually an underperformer is very surprising to me mm -hmm. because every time that I play playing against Yuriko, it's the threat at the table because it has an inevitability built into it, but that also might be the why behind this what? Why is Yuriko underperforming? Well, everybody knows what Yuriko does and everyone targets Yuriko. Or another answer it might be, I don't I don't know these answers. We're just they're they're just questions. All the tournaments are grindy metas with a whole bunch of creatures that can block. And so Yuriko maybe has a little bit more trouble connecting than it used to in other metas that were a little bit lighter, that were more spell based, you know? And so that might be a question to ask, but you'd have to look at bigger data sets. You'd actually have to see that. But to see Yuriko on this list and be an underperformer is actually very surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the bigger surprises to me, although not quite as big of a surprise as kind of the next two decks that I listed as potential underperformers. Kark Sakashima won tier one con in the summer of 2022. 24 appearances in this data set, only two top 16s, so only one out of 12 times. And Kennen, a deck that's really been, really seems like it's been on the rise lately. 45 appearances, only four top 16 
performances over that data set and no no tournament wins. Um, this is a deck that uh, Ian has recently picked up and played a lot mm-hmm. as well. Comedian MTG, shout out to him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, despite that, it uh, it really does not appear to be doing all that well in the data set. Um, and again, I don't know really what to make of both of those things for... Well, actually, I do. I have an opinion on Kark Sakashima. I do think people respect creatures now more than they did of summer uh, in the summer of 2022, and we're gonna we're gonna see that opinion come up again when we talk about some of these other decks in a little bit. Um, Kark, if you can keep Kark off the table, that deck doesn't do anything. So um, very I, commander dependent. Yeah, it's yes. very commander dependent. It's a two-two with no innate protection to it. So okay. it's so it is not the most difficult commander to keep off the board if you really decide that's what you want to be doing with your game plan. So, um, but Kennen does surprise me because it's, like I said, it seems to be a deck that's been a bit on the rise and we've seen a couple, there's been a couple different builds of Kennen out there lately. The most recent decks seem to be more kind of a hybrid between a combo deck and like a big flips deck as well. Mm-hmm. I think you guys talked about that on a recent episode of the podcast, actually. So, mm-hmm. so Ryan, if you don't mind commenting a little bit on what you think is going on with Kennen in particular, um, or if you have any other thoughts on Kark Sakashima as well. Sure. So the first thing is Kark Sakashima. I will say that we do not currently have Monarch's data set in this mm-hmm. data set. Mm-hmm. So that's why you don't see a uh, a, a win, uh, you know, a mm-hmm. top four or a sure. win here, because we don't actually, well, I'm sorry, you do not actually have Monarch's data set yet. Um, maybe that's something that you could get in the future and something mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, one day in the future. But that's why you're not seeing it, even though, you know, you literally said, you know, hey, this one tier one con last year. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why you're not seeing it here. And if that data can be put into that, that'd be great, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but going into Quark Sakashima, I think basically everything you said was pretty accurate. It's a very commander dependent um, deck. And so a Dreneth Magistrate just makes it so it's casting in the festivities, which is not mm-hmm. that great on its own, you know, and other things like that. It, it really built to storm and based on its commanders and they are kind of the crux, which is a strong point and a weak point. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. if you know how to target it, it's per, it's it it is its proverbial Achilles heel. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very powerful when they're put together. But everyone knows just to bolt the Karkashima. I'm sorry, the, the Kark with Sakashima on the stack mm-hmm. and that it, and it, it's, you're just sitting there because now you got to recast both. And so yep. that's really, really tough. Um, it's the second one that really surprises me and and it's Kennen. And the reason that it surprises me is I'm probably not alone because it has 45 appearances. So I bet it's surprising a lot of other people mm-hmm. too. That's yeah, a that's, lot of appearances. That's that's the third most played deck in the in the data set actually. So third yeah. most played. So what are my thoughts on Kennen? Number one, it's a fun deck and it can do a lot of things, but I think also there is a certain degree of unknown with Kinnon mm-hmm. of what type of deck it is. Is it a House of Mirrors build where you're trying to assemble two things and just win? Or is it, like you said, is it a big flips build where you're just trying to activate Kinnon and put gigantic game ending threats on the battlefield? Or is it a hybrid? Or is it something else? You know, it's really difficult to, you know, assess when you're sitting across the table from Kinnon what it is, but you know, one way or another, Kinnon just can't stay on the battlefield. That's really what it is. It's one of those kind of commander centric type decks. And I know there's some people that are going to argue and say, well, you don't need Kennen to win. Uh, if you if you're in a big flips variant, you just you dump all your mana into like a Neza Hall or a Con Sphinx and then find a way to get there. And I agree with all that. Mm-hmm. But it's the idea that Kennen is what it propels you forward and accelerates you forward to keep up with the rog size of the world and the Tim Croms of the world mm-hmm. that allows Kennen to be able to compete at these tables. Because other than that, you're just casting Atlanta or Elves and passing. And you and I both know that that is just not very fast in today's meta. It's not usually enough to keep up. Right. Yeah, but I don't know about you, but I've been seeing a lot of Graph Tigger's Cages lately as well. Yes. So, and that, Ken, and that is probably the single biggest tax piece that deck does not want to see. So. And that's actually a really good point. So this mm-hmm. is once again what we're talking about when we're talking about asking better questions based upon the data that's given it to us. So... A uptick in anti-breach decks will usually have a side effect of having an uptick against hate in Kennen. Um, so people runs Curse Totem, Kennen is, you know, Kennen that hurts Kennen a lot. People run Linvala, hurts Kennen a lot. People run Graft Digger's Cage, hurts Kennen a lot, because it also hurts the breach decks and stuff. Um, 
it, all those types of things have a side effect of also hurting the Kenan decks that are maybe more targeted towards more generic things like the Winotas of the world, the Timnacroms of the world, and and or maybe I should say more generically the Breaches of the world. Mm-hmm. And maybe Kenan is just kind of one of those uh, collateral damage that happened mm-hmm. from that. We I don't know the answer to that. This is kind of conjecture based upon the data we're seeing. Yeah. But 45 appearances and only four top 16s is actually as surprising to me as Yuriko is. Yeah. I'm very surprised by that information. I, I would say to me, this is the single most surprising data point in the entire data set to me is that Kenan is underperforming by such to such a degree um, right now. Now, it could be that maybe re- the recent builds have only really been, you know, only shown up a few times. One thing this data set cannot tell us is what exactly cards were played, because unfortunately, most of these, um, the way I got most of these commanders is there's actually links to the author's um, deck list, and people are still free to tinker with those deck lists in the meantime. So, you know, sometimes even the day after the tournament, they've already changed their list. And so, unfortunately, we cannot tell the exact builds people are on from this data set. That's actually impossible to obtain yep. the way th- these data are collected. So. And that's a really good point to bring up because one of the things that Eminence is doing is they are working with deck building websites like Moxfield mm-hmm. to uh, actually lock those in place. What they do mm-hmm. is they take a deck and after it's been submitted for the tournament, you can't change it until after the tournament's over. And what the Eminence software does behind the scenes is essentially makes a copy of all those decks. Mm-hmm. So it actually does lock them in place which is really nice Mm -hmm. and so while we didn't always have that from the very beginning of eminence's history we are starting to see that i and i can't remember exactly when that started but we are starting to see that happening now so not only can we extrapolate commanders and essentially deck archetypes but we can actually start to freeze frame exactly what a meta looked like from a tournament perspective and what the cards were seen and stuff Mm -hmm. you know kind of as of you know the last couple months which is a really good piece of data to extrapolate one day in the future yeah exactly yeah yeah I'm, I, I have noticed that the last couple of tournaments it seems like the deck list actually went, linked to an eminence events deck list which is which is exactly what you said the software's basically freezing the data in time behind the scenes and then posting it on the web for everyone to look at so in future data sets those are questions we probably will be able to answer, but in this particular data set, unfortunately, just too many of the tournaments have not done that, so we can't actually see the individual card choices within the lists themselves. Yep. So, yep. Um, okay, uh, the last two decks I kind of have is underperforming, and I have an asterisk by besides both of these because these are, I believe, at least may be kind of the effect of individual great pilots um, are kind of propping these decks up maybe a little bit more than they should be, and that is Tim to Malcolm and Winota. In this data set, both of these decks have won in a tournament. Tim the Malcolm has appeared 19 times. It's made two top 16s with one tournament win. But both of those top 16s and the tournament win have been by the same individual. Ben, I apologize, Ben. I'm going to butcher your last name here. Ben Loeb or Ben Lave. I'm not sure. I think it's Loeb, yeah. Mm-hmm. Loeb, okay. So similarly with Winota, it has 36 appearances. One of the most frequently played, I think like the sixth or seventh most played deck in the, in the, um, in the data set. It has four top 16s which already is a little bit below bar um, with one tournament win. But guess guess who two of those top 16s were from? Ryan. So Mike, it was from Mike Sad. Played Mike with power Sad. member Mike Sad. Yep, one of the best players that I know. Yep. Yeah, in my opinion, for the best, yeah, Winota pilot in the world for sure and one of the best technical players and best politickers that I personally know and play against regularly as well. Yeah, yep. um, if you take Mike's two... You know, Punt City 1 and Punt City 2 performance out of this, there are 34 appearances with only two top 16s and no tournament wins in that data set. So, Mike, you are skewing the data all by yourself. So, thanks Knock for that, off. buddy. So, yeah, stop it. Stop <laughs> Knock it. it so, off. yep. And anyway, if you take Ben Loeb's two performances out of that data set, Tim the Malcolm has 17 appearances with no top 16s in there. Yep. So, these, I think, are pretty clear indicators of individually good pilots are propping up these data more than they should be so or at least the data suggests that yeah we obviously don't have the answers to everything right now but that Mm -hmm. definitely suggests those types of things ian from community and mtg is a fantastic pilot in cdh Mm -hmm. you give ian anything and he becomes the best pilot of that deck quite Mm -hmm. frankly and the same thing could be the same thing could be said about mike they are both fantastic magic players fantastic pilots and fantastic cedh players Mm -hmm. and 36 appearances 
and we only have four top 16, that's definitely that's definitely feels like an underperformer. Mm -hmm. But also, once again, like you said, maybe it's the graph diggers cage effect. People are mm -hmm. trying to tech against Winota. Maybe the cat's out of the bag because it won uh, the first punt city and everyone's like, mm -hmm. oh, got to tech against Winota. Definitely need to do something about Winota. And same thing with maybe Kennen. Oh, God, I'm going to see a lot of Kennen. And mm -hmm. so maybe people are specifically tacking against this, which is causing a lot of extra burden to for these decks to try and push through. And not all pilots can push through that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, Mike even said in his top four tournament report from Punt City 2 that he posted earlier this week um, that he thinks Winota is in a bad spot in the meta right now. And he probably yep. would not play it again if he were trying to you know, do well in a tournament. So he, frankly, he expected not to do well in this tournament too. He just brought it cause he loves the deck and frankly, it's pretty blingy and he wanted to look at pretty cards all weekend. And then he just ended up talking his way in the winds over and over again. Like he always does. <laughs> like he always, always does. does. Big shout so. out to Mike. He's a fantastic pilot and a great guy. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Okay. So let's go on to the, the last two kind of main data sets that you have here. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. So next up are decks that are performing as ex kind of as expected. With and so for this, I mean decks that are converting between ten and fifteen percent of their players into the top sixteen. So that's that's kind of an average range that I would expect in this data set. There's two I want to talk about in particular, and I'll talk about why in a minute. We'll just the the one I think we can kind of breeze over real quickly is Kenrith. Um, it has twenty appearances with three top sixteen performances. Perfectly average performance. Not you know best deck in the format by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly a reasonable deck if you're a fairly proficient pilot you know it's perform it's doing its job it's putting you in there at about at about at the rate you would expect it to mm -hmm. the two the next two like i said we wanted to talk about because these are really spicy and that is Najila. 48 appearances with six top 16 performances that is right smack dab at 12.5 percent conversion rate and blue farm i said we were going to come back and pick on it a little bit 91 appearances nearly mm -hmm. double all the other uh, the next uh, highest appearing uh, deck which is Najila. 13 top 16s, which is a conversion rate of 14%. So again, it falls in that 10 to 15% uh, range. Um, and it does have one tournament win, most recently, Punt City 2. So, mm -hmm. um, But I have them in this data, and I want to talk about them specifically because these two decks are always in the conversation of best decks in the format. And at least if you go by conversion from Swiss to top 16, they are nowhere near the top of the data here. And so here is where our YouTube comments come in, Ryan. So, so what, uh, what, this is, this is an area that when I first started this project was surprising, but I kept seeing this over and over again as I added more and more tournaments to the overall data set. They just weren't really, actually Blue Farm was actually underperforming, but it did really well upon City too. So it actually kind of bumped back up into the expected range now. So, um, so yeah, Ryan, what do you make of this? So, uh, so first of all, Najila and Blue Farm are, when you say that these decks are performing as expected from the data, which mm -hmm. interesting as what, what is an interesting fact about that statement is, is the fact that they're not overperforming exactly. is what makes this a wild statistic. Exactly. You would expect the best decks in the format to overperform, and we will see decks in a little bit that are overperforming, and, and you'll be able to compare those numbers. These decks are performing just average. No, they're not bad decks. They're clearly not bad decks at all. So even in this data set and real world experience suggests that. So, but they are not overperforming like we would expect the best decks in the format to be doing. So, And that's the yeah. thing. Blue Farm is in the lead by a mile over double the appearances of the next deck. So why isn't it putting in the numbers? And this goes into theories that I have about the factor of CEDH outside of the tournament thing. We all know that, or most of us know that CEDH is commander, the format, and we all play commander for fun. And unequivocally, when you ask people, what is one of the most fun decks that they ever play? A lot of times they will say blue farm. Blue farm is a blast to play because of the amount of game actions you take, the amount of answers that are always in your hand, and the amount of times that you can work with a table and actually interact very heavily in a, with a table and in throughout the, a particular game. Blue Farm is fun. It is a fun deck. Najila is a fun deck to play. But that doesn't mean from a tournament and data perspective that it is the best deck 
What this data is suggesting is not that Blue Farm is the best deck in the format. It's just the most popular yeah. deck in the format is really what this data is suggesting. Middle of the road, it's not a bad deck. It's not some tier two that everyone holds on to because it's their love. Shout out to Godo. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a middle, it's a it does middle of the road things and everybody, you know, agonizes and contemplates and discusses and argues and yells at each other and past each other about the best deck in the format. And this data is suggesting that neither of these actually are the best deck in the format. Yep. Yeah. Um, thinking about this a little bit today before prepping for this episode, Najila might very well be kind of a byproduct of the increased amount of creature hate we've been seeing as well. It's got two toughness. It dies to a lot. So including a stiff blocker sometimes. So, yep. yep. Um, and so that's, it doesn't need his commander to win, but it's, but it's commander is a part is, you know, one of its pivot points. So, and it's, it's a way it can win. If you kill the commander, you do take away one of its, you know, winning lines, for instance. So blue farm, I think it's, it definitely is a good deck, but people take a lot of game actions, but every game action you take is the opportunity for a mistake. And so I feel like if you're not playing this deck optimally, it may not perform as well as it could. I think if you put Blue Farm in the hands of a great player, like if Mike were to pick up Blue Farm, I'm sure his win rate would be astronomical. And he's talked about picking it up. So looking forward to playing against him at the shop for that, for sure. So Definitely. Um, and then obviously you put it in the hands of, uh, you know, a Magic Pro like Brian um, Cobal, who is now won two tournaments, only one of which is in this data set. Yes, I recognize it has, that he has won two tournaments with it, but only one is in this data set. So, um, and um, so, um, this might be a case where in the hands of a great player, these decks overperform, but in the hands of an average player, they are just average decks as well. It could be that phenomenon. Again, the data can't tell us this. We are speculating on what we think may be going on here. Oh. Yep. And it's important to reemphasize this. The data is telling us what it is not telling us why mm-hmm. we have to try and use this data to ask better questions. And that's what we're trying to do. We're using this data and we're saying why after everyone has been harping forever about why Blue Farm is the best deck in the format, is the data not confirming that, not Mm -hmm. saying that, even after such a huge data set in relation to the rest of it. I know that we talked about there's only so many tournaments and there's only so much data and this, that, and the other, but there's 91 appearances of this deck. If it was the best deck in the format, why isn't it showing us that in this data? That's the question that I would like to have answered yeah, uh, because and, and, I think it's a very important question. Yeah. And quite frankly, because it have the most it has the most appearances, this is the data point I'm actually most confident is most likely to be correct, actually. So if we were to, you know, extend this, da- extend these data out another year or two. So, mm-hmm. um, so, it, and again, the GLA, the second most played deck in the data set. So, um, there are some others in the 40s, but it's it's the second most. Yep. So again, a data point, I'm a little bit more confident that this is probably more likely to be correct. So again, not it's not definitive, but yep. the, trend, the trend seems to be that these two decks are not performing the way the best decks in the format we would expect them to be doing in tournaments. So you heard it here first. Sean says, Blue Farm sucks, and you're a bad person for playing it. Congratulations, everyone. Please that direct all inquiries to Sean, not to playing uh, with power. Fortunately, I'm not on Twitter, so that shouldn't. So good luck finding me. So. You lucky, lucky man. <laughs> You're so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm just joking, everyone. But like, yep. so, like I said, this is this is a phenomenal revelation. Quite frankly, this data is saying that these are just average decks. That's what they are. They're average. They're not bad. No one is saying here that they're bad. What we are saying is that the data suggests that they are not as good as everyone on the internet is making them out to be. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting. Again, it le- again and it might be that they are, and I mentioned this earlier, I just want to emphasize it. It might be the case that in the hands of fantastic pilots with lots of reps on these decks, they will overperform, but in the hands of you know, the average, you know, the average or even probably slightly above average players who maybe don't have as many reps on them. They're not doing great. So in other words, don't switch to the Jailer or Blue Farm and get 20 reps in before your next tournament. Expect to do well. These decks will not do that for you. So yep. that's right. They just suggest and, that. So. And that piece of information can also be extrapolated to, I would say, almost anything in the top third. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying about some tier F deck that is 99 mm-hmm. mountains and an Ashling the Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. I'm saying about, you know, actual CDH decks, you know, 
that's not necessarily always just, you know, the best pilot will grab it and make it the best stack. You know, there's something to be said about this data here that is suggesting it's not just good pilots only. Yep. You know, we have we have a very large sample set here to show mm-hmm. that this is actually probably just an average middle of the road commander. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. All right. I think we're ready to move on to our last section here, which is the overperforming decks. So these are decks that have at least 12 appearances in the data set and have a greater than a 15 percent top uh, Swiss to top 16 conversion rate. So we're going to start with the one I'm not as confident on calling. And this is Sisse Weatherlight Captain. It has 12 appearances with four top 16 um appearances, including one most recently upon City 2, um, you know, very recently here. Um, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to this deck. I know Cal highlighted it in an article he wrote for uh, TCG Player um, recently mm-hmm. as a deck to watch, and he's absolutely right. This is not a lot of data, but it's but um, it is definitely overperforming. It's got a 33% conversion rate, um, which is which is good. So, um I, again, I, I haven't explored the archetype a lot. I don't know what builds really necessarily are out there. I don't know if you've looked at anything like this, Ryan. Um, I haven't mostly, played against this deck that much either. So. Yeah, fetching up a Planeswalker combo. Basically, mm-hmm. the first thing you fetch up is uh, Teferi that locks out your opponents, and then you're just free to go off is yeah. really what it is. So th- if, that first re- you know, if that first activation during your winning turn resolves, the game's over, unless you mm-hmm. like punt the win, of course. But like, it, it, essentially, your opponents can't do anything. Yep. And Fair so enough. maybe, uh, but once again, like you said, there's not exactly a ton of appearances here. Mm-hmm. Um, but based upon the day you're saying, it does seem to tilt, you know, sway towards the overperformers. Yeah, exactly. This is one to certainly keep an eye on. And if you're looking for a new deck, this uh, this seems like one that could be a reasonable choice if, if you're going to bring one to a tournament sometime in the next, you know, in the, in the near future, unless a, unless a upcoming set really shakes up the meta, of course. So. Yep. Yep. All right. Next two decks, Rocco. Ryan, the deck you played at Pun City 2. 19 appearances, four top 16 um, showings for that. And then Malcolm Tana, so 27 appearances with five top 16 performances. And you should note, Cal missed uh, the top 16 at Pun City 2 on Tiebreaker, so we nearly got a sixth one in there yep. as well. These are not, like, massive. They're not. They're still not, you know, quote-unquote, the best decks in the format, but they are overperformers as well. Um, Ryan, are you surprised by either of these decks? Um. Malcolm Tana does not surprise me. It's a very good deck, quite frankly. It's been around for a while. We've we've all familiar with it. It wins really quickly with good draws. Very quickly. Um, Mm -hmm. Rocco, I I I am a little surprised by it. Rocco has struggles in some areas. Uh, One of those areas Mm -hmm. it struggles with is it's on the stack. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't do very well there. but Rocco can be built about a thousand different ways. And if you're a savvy player, you can steer people in one direction and kind of direct, you know, their plays to reflect maybe a build of Rocco that you're not on. Mm-hmm. So let's say that you, you know, might lead them to believe that they're playing against the stacks version when you're on a turbo version and you might be able to get out from under them. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I could go on for Rocco for hours, but that's not what this is about. Mm-hmm. But basically uh, it does surprise me a little because, like I said, it's it's not the strongest deck out there. It's really not. It's a great deck. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be built a lot of different ways, which is really cool. Yeah. But it, like I said, it, it it has it has weaknesses. So seeing it here, um, it it is a little surprising, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. I I would expect it to be maybe in the average or even the below average, quite mm-hmm. frankly. Mm-hmm. Yep, Ryan. Before looking at these data, if I told you that these are among the five or six best performing tournament decks would you have been surprised because i know i would have been so quite frankly with some of these i am not surprised with enough with some of the others i am shocked quite frankly yeah yeah i mean rocco Rocco and malcolm tana specifically yeah rocco and malcolm tana if you said Mm -hmm. that they were overperformers, i would i would have definitely believed you 100 percent when it comes to malcolm tana Mm -hmm. uh rocco i would have been a bit like oh really that is a little surprising i would have been Mm -hmm. shocked but i would have been like you know rocco can get there so yeah Okay, good. Um, um, another one, an archetype that used to be the best deck in the format when, when Flash was legal, uh, Tim Thrasios, 30 appearances with five top 16 performances. Not a huge overperformer by any stretch of the imagination. Not not really in the conversation, for my opinion, the, the best of the best decks, but still overperforming. So 
Uh, so this is actually, I believe, the only deck without red in it. Or no, that's not true, actually. I, I take that back. We are going to um, the, we're um, gonna get to a different deck in a minute uh, about yeah. that. But yeah, one of the two decks that are overperforming without red in it as well. And again, as you said, there's different ways to build this deck. I believe the uh, the one that just made the, the elimination rounds at Punt City 2 was a Razakats deck, which is sure was. an archetype we have not seen perform well recently. So shout out to that pilot for bucking the bucking the trends and doing well. So. Dan. Shout yeah, out to Dan, Dan. Dan Brown, that's right. Yeah, so, Dan was yeah. the one who brought it in. Shout out to Dan. Great pilot on this deck. Yep, yep. So This is the one that shocks me, okay. quite frankly. The, ne- the next one we're about to. No. Oh no, TNT. TNT performing yep. shocks me. Yep. Because if there is one thing that is said all over the internet about CDH and decks and best decks, it is that Blue Farm is the best deck. The second most said thing is that Timna and Thrasios is no longer good. It's a bygone era. Don't play it. It's not in red. Not a good deck. Don't play it. It is it. And that is what shocks me mm-hmm. is that that not only is Timna and Thrasio still viable in the meta, still being played, but is actually overperforming despite everyone screaming at the top of their lungs that if you're not playing red, you're not playing right. And Timna and Thrasios being here proves at least or at least gives us a lot more data to suggest that that's not true. And that's what is amazing because Timna and Thrasios is a fantastic deck. Obviously, the data is saying this, but like it was always a good deck, but everyone got shiny toys in red over the last four years and dropped Timna and Thrasios. Mm -hmm. And it's still doing very well. It's still performing like it did before, but everyone jumped onto blue farm and five color Najila and, mm-hmm. and all these other decks with red in them. Cause they wanted to play breach lines and dockside and deflecting SWAT. And it just goes to show you that, Hey, this deck is actually still very, very good. And maybe you shouldn't just ignore it because it doesn't have red. It, it kind of kicks dirt in the face of everyone who's so confident in what they say online that says that Tim Nathrasios is no longer good or that red is the best color and there's no denying it. These are the things that I love to see in these data sets that says, well, the data isn't exactly saying what you are trying to tell and convince the world. This data is actually saying something else. And these are the things that I love about data driven you know, uh, extrapolating different things from data. I think that's amazing, personally. I love that Tim Nathrasios is here. Yep, me too, yeah. Who knew card advantage in the command zone with both your commanders was good. So, How about that? Yeah. I mean, people were complaining. It's like, oh, you have to draw six through Thrasios because you have to cast mm-hmm. Thrasios and activate it. So it's six to draw one, ten to draw two. What a horrible rate. Thrasios is dead. Don't play Thrasios anymore. Turns out, not so bad. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, the last three decks to talk about. These are the, in my opinion, the best of the best performing decks. Again, at least in this in this data set, not necessary, maybe not overall, but at least in this data set. First up, we have Thrasius Bruce, forty two appearances with seven top sixteen performances um, in that or appearances in that in that time frame. Next, Rogsai, Roger. And or Rograk and Silas Wren, 42 appearances, the same number as Thrasius Bruce, 11 top 16 performances. So, and finally, Tivit, yes, the six mana commander, 32 appearances, nine top 16 performances, and one tournament win. These are all decks that have appeared more than 30 times and have multiple top 16s with multiple pilots behind them, and they are consistently doing well. Ryan? Give us some color commentary on this. So first of all, I don't think there's much to say about Roger Silas. If you had told me that Roger Silas was an overperformer, I'd be like, yeah, of course it is. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah. like there's nothing really to say about Roger Silas. Mm-hmm. And it's just a very good, consistent, fast deck. Yeah. And it has the data to prove it. Yeah. Um, and, and of note, this is a deck that people have put in the conversation of among the best decks in the format. And these data actually do bear this out that this may very well, in fact, be one of the best. Yeah, the data is starting to back up those claims. Exactly. So those claims are getting backed by real data now saying, hey, Roger Silas is one of the best decks in the format. Okay, we'll prove it. Yeah, sure. Here, how about 11 top 16s? 
like that 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 that's a really good case for it to mm-hmm. be there. Yeah. Um, now, so yeah, I would say it's an over. I would say it's an overperformer, and and honestly, doesn't surprise me. Yep. Yeah. Now I do think at least two or three of those performances are by um, Alana. Is that is that her name? Yeah, so, Alana. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Fantastic obviously, pilot. really good pilot. Used yep. to play Blue Farm a lot, but now plays Rog. So. I, so I, apparently she has seen the light without this data set. So good for seen her. Seen the for, light. Say good for her for Blue switching Farm, over. Yeah. Friendship with Blue Farm over. Rock yep. is my new best friend. Exactly. Yeah. Sounds she, good yeah, for if, Alana. If you, don't know, if you don't know who she is, she's not talked about enough in the community. She's an extremely consistent performer. Um, top 16 is nearly every tournament she enters. In the last three or four tournaments, she's played Rock Size. So, so yeah. if, if some of the best pilot. players, in the, if some of the best tournament performers out there are switching to Rock Size, that should be another data point that says maybe they know something I don't. So, yep. yep. What about so, Thrasios Bruce? So. Thrasios Bruce, that one surprises me a little mm-hmm. um, because every – what's the best way that I can put it this way? Um, Thrasios Bruce, you kind of – like, is it an advantage build? Is it a combo build? Is it, well, is it a mid-range build? You know, you're not always exactly sure. Sometimes people build Thrasios Bruce just as a color, you know, just for the mm-hmm. color. Like I want to use, I want to build Tim to Thrasios, but I want red. Um, and so they'll do Thrasios Bruise instead and they'll build it like TNT. Uh, and other ones that are like on evolution builds or advantage builds. And honestly, I didn't see that performing too well. Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought that powering out something like a Zerta or, you know, something like that would have been the key to this, you know, deck success. And but the thing is, there's a lot of different builds of this particular one. And I think it's super interesting that of those different builds, kind of like the Kinnon thing we talked about earlier, all these different builds can be of Kinnon. So it could be a lot of different things or even Rocco that Thrasios Brews with its different variants out there is actually overperforming in its tournament results. Yep. I do want to note one interesting thing in the data. This are not the data set's not large enough to make anything out of this, but of those seven and top 16 performances, none of them have even made the finals of the tournament. So, mm-hmm. so the deck has actually underperformed a bit once it gets to the elimination rounds. But if your goal is to get to get to the elimination rounds and figure it out from there, this these data suggest that this might be a very reasonable choice to to bring to to bring to your next tournament. Interesting. Yeah, and and I think your point about there being there's at least four distinct builds out there. You know, there's evolution, there's blue pod, there's mm, Dawn yeah. Waker, which is kind of you know midway between the two, and then there's a Wild Pile, which is just a completely right. off the wall deck. But Wild Pile itself does is actually one of these top sixteen performances. So it Same. it that particular build of Bruce Dastrius has broken through at least once. So yeah, yep. Okay, and then the, and then the, the, the final, final deck, one. Yeah. Yep. T- Tivit. Tivit. Mm-hmm. So what were people saying about Tivit? It costs too much. It doesn't have red in it. Uh, I don't I don't think this deck performs. Yeah, it, you, you can use Time Sieve to win with it. But is that really enough? Apparently it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ward three is a horrible mechanic and I hate Ward. I yep. should have never had Ward three. I hate that card. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I hate that card is because it's just so good. Some people argue, oh, well, you know, never uh, you. I love to see Tivit because my dock side makes at least five. It's like, come on, Tivit does more than just feed your dock side. And you're just you're you're showcasing a lot of bias when you say things like that. So when people are saying things like Tivit's no good because it's in bad colors, that's more like armchair deck building and armchair theorizing. And that's really what I want to get away from with these types of projects that you're building with this type of data set. I want to get away from that conjecture and that judging things in a vacuum and determining before anybody even tries that it's no good and everyone throws it away. Mm -hmm. We see here that Tivit does really well, quite frankly, not just okay, like really well. And you never would think it by looking at a six mana value Esper commander. Mm-hmm. It it just doesn't look that way, but it works so well. Once it's on the table, it's super hard to get rid of. It has mana advantage and card advantage built in. Mm-hmm. And at the same a, time. At the yeah, same time. At the same time for one commander, mm-hmm. you don't even need to run partners. Mm-hmm. It's so good in that. You have some of the access to some, you know, black, so best, some of the best cards, blue, strongest color in the format, mm-hmm. fight me. Like it is. Mm-hmm it's just it's really really good and i love that it's here quite frankly i yeah. love that the data set is showing that hey everyone that thought tibbet wasn't good and that they try and brush it off by saying well 
Ian piloted the one, so mm -hmm. that's why it did well. No, we're actually seeing that that's not the case. Ian didn't pilot all nine top 16s. Nope. You know, he piloted one of them, I think, in fact. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the other eight are so, different pilots. Tivit being here is, I think, is great. I think it's mm -hmm. wonderful to see this kind of stuff. Yep. I would agree. Um, I know when we were, uh, when we were, you know, we were in the same testing group for uh, Punch City 2, and one of our partners, Bailey, now has two top 16s with the decks. Shout out to Bailey, including at Punch City 2. Uh, when he was playing the deck, I'm like, wow, this deck just finds ways to win over and over and over again. So it's yes. kind of nuts how good the deck actually is. So um, if uh, I do think um, this would be Tibbet alone would be a reason if you weren't packing red elemental blast and pyroblast in your red decks before that is the best way to deal with tivit on the stack red blast it so you will set the yeah. pilots back very far if you can get that to resolve but once tivit yeah. is on the field good luck getting rid of it you really need to dress down plus plus more interaction to really truly get it off the table and if they get a displacer kitten out there with it the game is basically over at that point it's, so, yeah it's basically yeah. over it's such a it's such a good deck there's yeah. so many different axes axes i keep i don't know what axes, the right one yeah. is yep. I, there's so many different axes that it can pivot on oh i'll mm -hmm. do time sieve oh i'll do kitten oh i'll do stacks while i grind oh. out advantage and eventually oh, just here's, beat here's everyone Thorical with Com commander here's damage here's combo so yeah. <laughs> oh yeah and by the way here's historical yeah. console yeah. just exactly. out of nowhere <laughs> exactly so yep <laughs> Out to the yep. best to the best win cons in the format, minus breach, of course. But yeah. of course, minus breach. Yeah. yeah. Who needs dockside when your when your commander makes treasures? So when you have so. uh, phantasmal image and mnemonic betrayal, yes, in the deck. Exactly. So oh yeah, mnemonic betrayal them. too. Yeah. Yep. A card that's probably underplayed. Although I think the I think the secret might be out a little bit on that one now. But yeah. Yeah. So okay. So that is pretty much all we had to talk about within the data um, here. So. Um, I didn't make this clear earlier on, but the reason I did not include any of the like chaos events or the um, monarch events is just because their data is not their their Swiss round data is just not publicly available um, to anyone. If they ever made it available to me either privately or made it available publicly, I would be more than happy to include those sort of tournaments. So this is not meant to be a knock against them at all. It's just no. Eminence and playing with power have made these data available online. And so that's why it has become, it's been a nice, it's been a nice journey diving into this. And really, cause like you, Ryan, I've, there were some surprising revelations in the, in these data. And again, nothing here is definitive. This is not enough data to call it definitive, but there are definitely trends, especially at some of these decks that have 30 plus appearances where we can start saying, you know what, these decks probably are good or the, or blue farm, not as good as people make it out to be that sort of thing. Yep. So, yep. I would love to revisit this in a year and see what the data is again. Is mm -hmm. will these place will these commanders still be in these places? Will other things show up? Will you know historical data start to influence certain things? There's a mm -hmm. ton of different questions we can ask here, and I would absolutely. love to see how this evolves over time. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, this is all really great work. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start to bring it to a close here. But before we do that, Sean, what are some of your final thoughts based upon this project that you have done um, or based upon the data that you have been pouring over? Uh, what are some things that you'd want maybe the listeners to know uh, about this project or uh, about what is going on here? Yep. Um I would, I would encourage everybody to keep an open mind when it comes to data like this. Um, it's very easy to take your pet deck, you know, like say you're, an, say you're a, a diehard Dejela player. It's very easy to take your pet deck and say, oh, well, because of A, B, or C subjective reason, you know, that I think this deck is really better than it is. And the, the reality is, is you may actually be right, but the data doesn't prove you right. doesn't prove your biases right either. You know what I mean? So I think, I think this is a, this is a game where, um, I think just like baseball and, you know, money, the money ball movement in baseball and things revealed revelations about the game. This is, this is an exciting time to be involved in CDH and be doing data collection because this is really the first time we've had data like this available. And so I've been thrilled to be able to pour it over. And, um, if, you, if, if you're one who is good at, good at looking at this, you can actually gain, gain an advantage on metagaming for upcoming tournaments and things like that as well. So. I would encourage people to at least be at the very least be open minded about these data and start asking the questions. Well, why, if this data is true, why might the data be true? Because I think that will, that will start to get you to think about things in a more open minded way. And, um, and I know for me personally, 
looking at this data, I kind I I feel like I was pretty accurate in predicting what was going to show up at Punt City Two. Looking at the se- the seven tournaments and this data set leading up to it, now I've added the Punt City Two data after the fact, of course. So um, I think it was really really helpful for me knowing what to t- what to tech against and what to expect, you know, that sort of thing. So um, and yeah, I'm really excited to see. If, will the landscape look completely different over the next eight to 12 months? Who knows? We'll find out again in a year, I'm sure, Ryan. So, mm-hmm. Yep, sure will. So, yeah, and to piggyback a little bit off of that as we come to a close is, once again, what I love about this data is that it allows us to ask better questions. Data does not necessarily give us all the answers, but it does allow us to ask these better questions. And with more data, it allows us to further refine what those questions are to ask. And that's what I'm loving about this. This is the things, these are the things that I love to see. What removal should I run in my deck as I'm bringing bringing it to a tournament? Well, I know that one third of the entire data, uh, entire sample set is going to be some weird rogue something or other, you know, that you're just not going to see a whole lot of. So you might want to consider packing something that's a little bit more generic from a removal perspective versus super hyper specific tech. Um, And so this allows you to ask those better questions of what you want to do in tournaments going forward or what you want to do in your CEDH meta. And that's what I love about these types of projects. All right. Okay. So with that, we are going to go ahead and bring it to a close. A big thanks to Sean for coming on to the show today. Thank you very much, Sean. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for agreeing to have me on, Ryan. So this has been a lot of fun. Good. I'm glad. All right. So now that you've heard the data and now you've heard what we said, what do you all think out there? What types of data would you want to extract out of this? You know, what kind of questions or answers or info would you want to extract from this data? Is there anything we missed? Is there something glaring that we're like, oh, we, we, we overlooked that? Any statisticians out there want to go ahead and tell us how bad we are at everything? feel free to let us know in those comments below. Um, Make sure to give us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast aggregator. You'd be surprised how much it helps us out. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and much more. All links are in the episode notes. And that about wraps it up for this episode of the podcast. Tune in next time when we talk more about our favorite format and our favorite game, Magic the Gathering. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time. 